Hey guys, welcome to Sandals Church where we are all about this vision of being real. And if you wanna take that vision a little bit deeper, go to our podcast called The Debrief at debrief.show where you get to hear Pastor Matt just dive deeper into this vision of being real. But thanks so much for joining us today. Enjoy the message. Hey Sandals Church, super excited because you are in for something special today. Look, a couple of years ago, I met this guy from Ireland, man, sounds like a Lucky Charms commercial, but he is so awesome. His name is Andrew McCourt and he's a dear friend of mine. Uh, Both Tammy and I, we've been praying and asking God to expand our friendships, literally uh, with pastors all over the world and God sent us Andrew. And he's here this weekend to bring us a word and he's gonna wrap up our series on how to never be alone. And so I just want you to give him a warm welcome and cheer him on as you're going to hear a life-changing message from a friend who's changed my life. So let's give it up for Pastor Andrew McCourt. Hey! Wow, Sandals Church! It's good to be here. And you need to listen carefully to this accent today because this is an Irish accent. And when you get to heaven, you're going to talk like this, everybody. Because this is the way God talks, the way I hear him anyway. So good to see you. Are you enjoying yourself today? Good. Well, I want to put a massive thank you out to Pastor Matt and Tammy for having us here. Um, They are great people. I got to meet Pastor Matt about two or three years ago, and we developed a friendship. He's a really cool guy, and I got to bring him to Ireland this year, you know? And you know Pastor Matt, he does that whole Iron Man thing, but when I brought him to Ireland, he got to meet some real men. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) We run on Guinness, people. No, we don't. (laughs) So uh, he's a great guy. We just love this church. This is a super church, everybody. Yes? Let's be encouraged. I've been to enough bad churches to recognize a good church, everybody. And this is a great church. And so we just want to thank you for having us here today. Uh, What a privilege. I am here with my wife, Isabel. Isabel, would you you stand up? Okay, she hates me doing this. Oh, yeah, that's her over there. Okay. And... um, Isabel is from France. Ooh la la. Okay. And uh, all of that's working because we got four kids, everybody. Four kids. Yeah. Four no more. That's our, that's our motto. Four no more. Back in Ireland, they didn't, they didn't know if we were like good Catholics or sloppy Protestants. That's a lot of children, everybody. They just didn't know what was going on. Um, and so we got four children. We got Ben, who's our oldest. He's going to be 23 this month. And uh, he was with us on vacation in the summer with his girlfriend. She's great. She's on our staff at Bayside. And uh, he got to the Sacre Coeur in Paris, in, in wonderful Paris, everybody. And he dropped to his knee. He brought out the ring. And she said, we, oui, uh, yes. And uh, yeah, it means we're getting rid of a kid. That's so good. And then we got Dan. He's 20 years old. He's studying at UC Davis. And then I've got my only girl in the world, my only girl. She's, her name is Abigail. And Abigail means father's joy, father's joy. And that's what she is to me. That's what she is to me, my only girl in the world. And all the fathers in the room will understand this. But the only reason I moved to America was so that I could buy a gun. That was it. <laughs> yep, right there. Uh, All the dads, yes? And I'm not scared to use it again. And uh, so that's Abigail. Then we've got Nathan, who's 14, and he's playing soccer right now. He's a soccer boy. He loves that soccer. So we're thanking God for our family. I'm thanking God that we are here in the United States of America, everybody. And it's so cool and a privilege to be here in Sandals, to be able to close out your series on the cure for loneliness. And you know that God has a cure for loneliness, and it's called relationships. God wants us to be in relationships. But the problem today in the world that we live in, with Facebook and Instagram, social media, and with all the gatherings that we get into, we've got so many relationships We need to prioritize them. And we're going to be talking about that today. How do we prioritize the key relationships in our lives so that we never end up in this lonely position? There's a great verse from the scriptures, and it's from the book of Psalms, and it simply says this, teach us 
to number our days. God, help us to do this, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Lord, we only have so many days. We've got tons of relationships. Help us, Lord, to prioritize the time that we have. So if you're brand new here to uh, Sandals, you're going to have a little sermon outline. It's like a piece of paper there with some writing on it. It's got some blanks in it. And if you're here and you're brand new, and maybe you're, you don't even know how you got here, maybe you just thought you were going to Costco and you took the wrong turn and you ended up here. Well, that's just a little thing that you can write in some of the answers. It's not a quiz. It's not like I mark it at the end and give you extra homework if you got it wrong. It's not like that. It Really, it's just a guide to how long I'm going to preach. So if I'm 30 minutes of point one, order pizza, everybody, okay? It could be a long day. But it's just a simple way of, of helping you remember some of the salient points from today. So are you ready to do this, everybody? Okay, that's good. Hey, you guys are good. 11.45, you're good. Lots of coffee in you. That's, you're like, okay. So priority number one is my relationship with God. My relationship with God. You got to hear me, everybody. We can have a relationship with the living God. That is pretty cool. I mean, if I was a personal friend of Steph Curry from the Warriors, I think I might just slip it in today, in today's sermon. If I knew Steph Curry and he and I were homies and buddies, I would slip it in. If I knew Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, I'd probably slip it into a, serve, into a sermon. But here's the reality, everybody. I know the living God. You know the living God. If you're a Christian, that's like the best boast in all of the world. That's like the best follow you're ever going to get. It's the best friendship you're ever going to have. Everybody, we know God. And it's a free relationship. He has made it free for us. You can't earn it. Uh, Pastor Matt and I, we've got a mutual friend, and his name is Sean. He's a great guy. And Sean's got a heart for Ireland. And, and one time, uh, his wife, Sonny, got uh, a trip to Ireland, but Sean had to stay here in America. And when she was back in Ireland after a church service, she was downtown Dublin, and she was having lunch in like this bar restaurant, and she looked over at the table across from her, and she was like, wow. And she rang her husband, Sean, immediately back to the United States and said, you will not guess what famous Irish man is sitting across from me in this restaurant? And he said, uh, is, it, is it Bono? I said, no, no, it's even more famous than Bono. Wow, who is it? Is it Andrew McCourt? No, <laughs> she didn't say that. Um, who is it? And, and then she said, it's, and it's this guy here. It's Conor McGregor, everybody. It was Conor McGregor. And if you don't know who he is, he's just a very quiet, shy reserved Irishman and doesn't say much at all. And, and, they, and they were like, wow. And this is what Sean said. I'll tell you what to do is get the visa card and give it to the waiter and let's pay for his lunch and all of his friends. That would be a cool thing. Call the waiter, give him the card. And a couple of minutes later, she felt someone stand behind her thinking it was the waiter. She turned around, but it was Conor McGregor and he was holding her visa card. And he said to her, thank you so much for your kind gesture of wanting to pay for my lunch today. But you can't pay for my lunch here. And she said, why not? He said, because I own the place. <laughs> I own the place. Look at me, everybody. God owns the place. God owns everything. And it's free for you. Everything is on the house. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished, and you can't earn your way into a relationship with God, buy your way into a relationship with God. All you can do is receive his friendship. It's free. It's so cool. And how do we keep that friendship and that relationship with God so fresh? How do we do it? Well, we do it through a thing called prayer. Anyone in here you like to pray? A lot of women putting up their hands. You know, come on, you guys. I mean, come on, let's be honest. I don't hear of many women coming to me and saying, Pastor, my husband prays far too much. We're always late to everything because he's in the house praying and praying and praying. Oh, my God. Can't get a word out of him because he's always talking to Jesus. I mean, let's be honest. Would anyone like the idiot's guide to prayer? The idiot's guide to prayer. Here it is, everyone. What is prayer? Prayer is about three words, and it's wow, it's help, and it's yes. If you're going, how do I make my prayer life so good? Well, just wow, help, yes. First of all, start with wow. Come to God and go, wow, God, you're actually listening. That's pretty wow. The creator of the universe is not too busy to listen to you. I mean, that's it. God wants a relationship with you. I, I just have the belief that when God goes to the heavenly fridge to get milk, my photo is on the fridge, everybody. Yes, 
It's just like, wow, God is interested in me. God is so awesome. God is omnipresent. He's like my mother. He seems to be everywhere, okay? He's just, he's incredible. God is the God who is the alpha and the omega, which means he's the beginning and the end. God is so wow that he finishes before he starts. That's cool, everybody. That's cool. God is standing at the finishing line while he's at the starting line. That's pretty awesome. That's it. And everybody, when you get the wow of God in your life, then it helps you with the help. Stop going into prayer and starting with help. Because when you do that, you make God that small. But when you see God this big, suddenly your problems begin to shrink. Yes? God can really help you with the help when you get on with the wow. And the last one is yes. Make sure that in prayer, that when you're talking, it's a relationship. God is talking to you, not only you talking to him, and make sure your answer is always yes. Is that good? Okay, so we do it through prayer, but we also do it through God's word, the Bible. Now, when I say the Bible, it doesn't make me a raving fundamentalist. It just means that I've got a moral compass in my life and the ultimate guide for truth. And God speaks to me through his word. Imagine this, that if you knew every single morning when you wake up, you would have a personal text message from God. Would you get up earlier? I think I would get up earlier. I wonder what God said to me this morning. Will you get that every day? It's called the Bible, everybody. It's God's text message to every single person. And the Bible is how we hear from God and keep the relationship passionate and intimate. And you need to read the Bible because it's also going to help you with your battles in life. So I've said I'm Irish, and Irish means that we're at the top of the food chain, everybody. It just means in the League of Nations, there's Ireland right up here. Obviously, the United States is number two, but it, like I would say <laughs> a joint second is going to be Scotland. Scotland, everybody. Is there any Scottish in the house today? Put up your hand if you're Scottish. Security, take their pictures right away and be careful during the offering with these people, okay? <laughs> and, and I used to live in Scotland. And Scotland is a great place. Um, and I went to visit this place. It's called Wallace Tower. Wallace Tower. And it's, uh, it's there to commemorate a great Scotsman by the name of William Wallace. And he is other, uh, otherwise known as who? <laughs> Braveheart, that's right. Braveheart, yeah, we've all watched the movie. They may take our children, but they'll never take our whiskey. That's right. And uh, it's a very confusing mo movie very, because it's an Australian acting as a Scotsman and it's all shot in Ireland. How confusing is that, everybody? But if, if you go to that tower, if you go to that tower, as you're winding up, halfway up, you get to see the original sword that belonged to William Wallace Braveheart. Look at it here. Now, to put it in perspective, the blade is four and a half feet long, four and a half feet. And with the handle, that sword was five and a half feet long, five and a half feet. Everybody, that's how you kill the English right there. That's how you do it. Calm down, you Americans. But this is the truth. It's kind of sad. That sword was built for battles, and now it's stuck in a box. Look at me. Your Bible was not made to live on a shelf. Your Bible was born and created to be put in your hand and for you to use it every single day of your life. The Bible actually says about itself in Hebrews 4 verse 12 that the Bible is like a double-edged sword that cuts through all the junk in our lives, all the bad attitudes. You want to have a good attitude? You read the Bible. You want to keep your life on track? You read the Bible. The Bible says it's like daily bread. It's more important than the meals that you're going to eat today is having the Word of God. So my number one relationship is with God, and I do that through prayer, and I do that through His Word. That's priority number one. Priority number two is this, my relationship with me. This is very important the relationship that I have with myself. I don't know if you've ever looked at stuff before, stuff that you're familiar with, maybe a thing you're really familiar with, and you've looked at it many times, but suddenly you look at it another time, and it's like, wow, I never saw that. Now, you Americans, you love your ice cream. You got some great ice cream here in America. Baskin Robbins, everyone? Yeah, yeah. Your 31 flavors, 31 flavors. But I don't know if you've looked at the logo and seen before 
The 31 is in the logo. Have you seen that? Everyone look at it. See there, the BR in the middle of the 3-1. Who's never seen that before? Who never saw that before? Look at all those hands going up. Like people are going, this, this is an incredible church. This is so deep, this church. This, oh my goodness. Oh, they only bring in the best of preachers. Look at that. You're going to forget everything else, but you're going to remember the 31. You're going to text your mother right now. We're going to Baskin Robbins today. I'm going to point something out you've never seen. I'm going to blow your mind. Hey, another one's Amazon. You all know the Amazon logo? Well, everyone, that's not a smile. That's an we deliver from A to Z. Look, look at people like, oh, this guy's Buddha. He's Buddha. There's like light coming off him. He's just incredible. It's amazing. Like you say, you can have a relationship with God. And like, whatever. Look at Amazon. Wow. All right. Okay. All right. Boy, people were like minions. Hey, well, over in Europe, we like our chocolate. We like our chocolate. And uh, you get it here, this particular chocolate, uh, once a year uh, from Costco. Uh, they, ha- they bring it out Toblerone. You know the triangular one that really hurts your mouth when you try to bite it? That one there. But I don't know if you've ever noticed on the Matterhorn there. That is the mountain, the Matterhorn. I don't know. Have you, can you see the bear, everyone? Have you ever seen the bear on the mountain? Look, there's a bear on the mind that's killed. But this last one for me, this is the best one. This is the best one, okay? Uh, a lot of people have seen this before, never notice it. Look at this here. I mean, look at that. For years, people have looked at that, and they've just seen a soccer ball, soccer ball. Look at this. You're watching carefully. It's a football, everybody. It's a ball, and you kick it with your foot. That's what you do. Come on, America. God has sent me to you. To convert you. What's the point of all of this? Because reality is, you can't have a relationship with you if you don't know who you are. And you've looked at yourselves a lot of times, but you know what? You've probably never seen yourself through the lens of God. When God sees you, he sees who you really are. Why? Because he is your maker. I'm going to tell you God's will for your life. God's will for your life is that you would vacuum with a Dyson. Mm. It's the bagless vacuum that maintains its suction right until the the last suck. It's incredible, everybody. But if you want to know about a Dyson, ask Sir James Dyson who designed it. God designed you. He knows you. He knows how you work. God comes in three persons. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is good theology. Is everyone okay with this, or do you want to do more logos? Listen, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this is what happens. The Bible says that when we are not a Christian, when we don't have a relationship with Jesus, we are dead in our sins. Ephesians chapter 2. Dead. I mean, doesn't dress that up. We're dead, either alive or dead. But God won't leave us like this. So God the Holy Spirit comes to us. And what happens is God the Holy Spirit quickens our conscience and attracts us to Jesus. He woos us to Jesus. God the Holy Spirit wants us to meet God the Son. And he brings us to Jesus because Jesus died for us and can cleanse us from all the junk in our lives. And then Jesus the Son wants us to meet God the Father. Isn't that so cool, everyone? God comes in three persons. God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. And the Son says, no one can go to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 6. And Jesus brings us to the Father. The Father loves us and embraces us. And then the Father says, I want you to meet someone you've never met before. And we're like, who's that? Who's that? And he goes, you. You've never met you before. You've met versions of you. You've met profiles of you. You've met instas of you, but you've never really met you. I designed you, and I want to introduce you to the real you. And where do we find the real you? Here it is here, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 23. It says, may God himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Look at me. God wants to change us like deep inside. Not a surface job, not cosmetics. God wants to do deep inside of us. But note what God does and how he explains who we are. He says, may your whole spirit, your soul, and your body, in the Greek, 
your pneuma, your spirit, your soul, your psyche, and your body, your soma, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. You see, God wants to change us. Can everyone say the word regeneration? It's a really important Christian and biblical concept. God wants us to be, John chapter 3, verse 3, he wants us to be born again or born from above, a brand new start in our lives. But he says, I'm going to do this on three different levels right inside of you. I'm going to do it in your spirit. I'm going to start there. And then I'm going to move to your mind, your soul, and your emotions. And then I'm going to move to your body. We're going to do that last. Note how God does it. So number one is that God gives us a reborn spirit. When we enter into relationship with Jesus, this is what happens. We call out to God, God, save me. And boom, in a moment, God, the Holy Spirit comes from heaven, comes inside of us. And what was dead comes alive. And we become God's zip code on earth. And we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I personally carry the presence of God inside of me. In a moment, I move from dead to alive, blind to seeing, from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in an instant, everybody. It's called an event, but the next one's a challenge because God moves us from a reborn spirit to a renewed mind, which is not an event, it's a process, everybody. How many people wish that a brand new mind was just an event? (laughs) But it's not, it's a process because God wants to take us on a journey from mood swings to mindsets. How many people need that journey? You need to get out of mood swings and you need to get into mindset, setting our minds and things above Colossians chapter three. And God wants to do that because God really understands before I can do something in your mind, I've got to get something alive in your spirit. So God sets us alive on the inside. He renews our mind. And the last thing that God does is that he repurposes our body. But can I tell you this? Here in California, we have a different theology and it's all upside down and it doesn't work. Because California says this, if you want to feel brand new, if you want to feel brand new, what you need to do is start with the outside, not the inside. And what you need to do is start with your body. If you want to feel better about yourself, join the gym. And joining the gym is good, but it's a, it's a losing battle, everyone. You're fighting gravity, and everything's going south. Everything's going south. It's, that's, that's what's happening to your body, okay? And, and then also in California, after the gym, it's like, well, we need to do more. And we all like, a, we like in California a little bit of nip and tuck, a little bit of nip and tuck, okay? My belly button used to be here, but now it's right here. But I'm feeling good. <laughs> nip and tuck. And and, and the theory goes that if you get a new body, you'll think better thoughts about yourself and you'll feel free in the inside. Yes? And it is good looks, good thoughts. And that's not, people, it doesn't work. Listen to what the Bible says. Bible says we're dead in sins. Let God touch you on the inside and you're gonna have an inner resurrection. You're gonna come alive. And then because of what God reveals to you, you're gonna think new thoughts about him, new thoughts about yourself. And then finally, you bring your body to the party. But in our world today, the body is king and we have this whole fight about identity. Everybody, the identity doesn't start with your body. It starts with your spirit, then it moves to your mind and then you submit your body to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me, everybody? That's how you have a relationship with yourself. You know who you are. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are spirit, we are soul, and we are body, and in that order. Priority number three, okay, is my relationship with my spouse. My relationship with my spouse. Now, single people, all the single people, all the single ladies, no, sorry, all the single people, you ready here? Don't tap out on me now. This is not a moment to uh, check your Instagram because this is important. Back to that previous point, if you're a single person and you're going, you know what, yeah, I, I'm interested in dating and I would like to get married, this is so important. You've got to understand who you are because if you don't know who you are, you can never introduce yourself to somebody else. Can I go full Irish with you here for a second? I go full Irish. See this language of like, oh, he makes me complete. That's nonsense. <laughs> That's nonsense. Reality is the biblical priorities is 
God makes us complete and we bring a complete person into a relationship because two halves don't make a couple. It takes two whole people to make a couple, yes? So this next point, the whole thing about spouse, this is your moment to go, and for married people as well, this is your moment to go, you know what, we gotta hear this because this is gonna teach us so much. I'm gonna ask you the question, where is the best place to learn to fly a helicopter? It's when it's on the ground, not when it's in the sky. You want to learn all the stuff when you're on the ground. That's when you want to learn about marriage. It's actually when you're single. It's so important. So let's read this verse. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. This is really important. Look at the word leave. A man will leave his father and mother. If you are the parents of teenagers today, this is good news, everybody, because God has designed our kids to leave. Can I hear an amen from anybody, okay? okay. <laughs> They'll soon be gone. Hallelujah. And if you've got a 45-year-old in your house, leave this verse on their pillow tonight. Would you do that in the name of Jesus? Just encourage them, all right? And will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And all the men said, God, sorry, man, this means sex. <laughs> That's what it means, okay? And, and can I just throw this in here? See, that, see this little ring here? See, see this ring that I have on my finger? See this ring? This is God's key into the sexual playground. You got a key into the gate and you can go in there and like, yay, go down the slide, you know, whatever you need to do, seesaw, you know, enjoy yourself in there, okay? That's the God's playground. That's, that you can just have fun. But if you don't have one of these, you're climbing over the fence and you're a trespasser. Amen? You all with me, everybody? Thank you, 1145. You're incredible. You really are. <laughs> and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Whoa, what has Paul done? Paul in the New Testament has gone to the beginning of the Old Testament. He's grabbed a verse from the book of Genesis, and he had said, this is God's will for you. God's will for you is to leave your parents, be united to a woman, li listen to this, and have sex, and that's good. It wasn't like when they had sex, they went, oh my word. What are, Gabriel, what are they doing? What are they doing in the garden? He was like, no, nah, yeah, that's really good. But what's the whole point of this? Listen, this is all about Christ and the church, everybody. About Christ and the church. You see, when a couple stand at the front and he goes, I do, and she says, I do, we do. Oh, wonderful. That's so cool. Actually, that is symbolic of what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you and he promised that he will never leave you or forsake you. You see, in life, I have commitments, but I've only got covenant with my wife. This is really important that we get this, people. You see, my daughter, Abigail, when she was young, and she was small, and she used to put on those little pink dresses, and she was so beautiful. She used to come up to me, and she used to sit on my knee sometimes and look me in the eye, and she would say this to me, Daddy, I will never leave you. And I used to look at her and think, you're a little liar. <laughs> Because someday when I'm sitting in the house polishing my gun, <laughs> some stupid boy's going to come to the door. <laughs> Listen to me. I love my daughter, but it's okay for her to leave when she's 50. Um, <laughs> I love my boys. It's okay for them to leave. They're designed to leave. But there's one person in the house that can't leave. And that's Isabel. She can't leave because I got all the keys. No, <laughs> she can't leave people. I can't leave either. Do you know why? Because I never made covenant with my children. Parents get this. This is so important. The priority of life. I never made covenant with my children. I only ever made covenant with Isabel. And this is really important as well. I never made covenant with the church. I love the church. I'm committed to the church. The church in America, the church in Ireland, the church in across the world. I never made covenant with the church. There's only one person that made covenant with the church, and that was Jesus that made covenant with the church. And Jesus says to me, Andrew, you look after your bride, and I'll look after my bride. A business person out there, listen to me. 
This is really important for you today. You never made covenant with your business. You made a commitment to your business, but not a covenant with your business. And the reality is, if your business is getting all your energy, all your creativity, all your management and leadership capacity, and getting all your fun, and you're coming home and being grumpy and not taking care of your spouse, you're having an affair. Are you enjoying this, or should I go back to the fun stuff? You didn't make covenant with your business. You made covenant with your spouse. And sir and madam, I know you're so cool and you're so uber talented. And I know that you're running the universe and you can make your company grow. But if your marriage is not getting the same level of attention, something is out of order in our whole list of priorities. This is going to sound like kind of Disney-esque, but this is important. My dad is like one of my heroes. My dad is, wow. My dad left Belfast when he was 16 years old and joined the Royal Marines. Any Marines in here? Any Marines? Come on, let's give it up for them, okay? Wow. My dad joined the Royal Marines. He became the middleweight boxing champion of the Navy. And while he was in the Marines, an incredible story, he became a Christian. He found Jesus and also found my mom. It was pretty good, okay? And he came back to Belfast and quick history lesson. At that time when he returned in, in 69, 70 to become a police officer, our country descended into chaos. Protestants and Catholics were fighting. It was open conflict, daily shootings and bombings. My own street was blown up as a child. It was carnage. And in the same year, my father, it was a case of mistaken identity. A young soldier was called for backup as my dad was in pursuit of some terrorists who had robbed a bank. My dad was just in plain clothes as a police officer, as a detective. He had his gun drawn and a young soldier that was meant to help just got freaked out and thought my dad was a terrorist. And he shot him from a distance of about 10 feet with the most powerful rifle in the world. It hit him there in the chest and went straight through his body, high velocity bullet, went straight through his chest, almost severed his right arm from his body and left a hole the size of two fists in his chest. We just don't know how he lived, but he lived. He lived, people. It was like, like the grace of God. A few years after that, well, he just took a medical discharge, became a pastor, and planted a church. <laughs> but he's now in his mid-70s. And can I say this? He's probably having the best season of his life. Why? Because my mom's not too well. Oh, she's still got her sharp Irish mind, her killer wit. She's still got all of that. But physically, she's not good. And my dad is like her care. My dad is looking after her and getting her a wee cup of tea. That's what we get in Ireland, a wee cup of tea. Getting her a wee cup of tea and does the dishes and tends to the house and passes her stuff all the time. And I sit and I look at my father when I'm back home and I'm going, I think God is really proud of you. You're not on national television. It's not The Bachelor. But you're a real man. Because it's one thing to stand at the front of the church as a young man, as a young man, you know, just excited, a little rampant and going, I do, I do, I really do. Please hurry up, I do. But it's another thing after 53 years of marriage to say, I did. Are you with me, everybody? That's what God is looking for. That's what God is looking for. So I got a relationship with God, a relationship with me, a relationship with my spouse, and then a relationship with my kids. My kids are really important. It says, 1 Timothy 5, uh, verse 8, Paul writes to the young man, and he says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. What Paul says here, you can be going to church, tithing to church, and have Christian verses all around your house, and have a fish on the back of your car. But if you're not looking after your family, uh, you're a pagan. It doesn't matter. You're not looking after them. This is a really, really big deal. Everybody in life, I have lots of opportunities, but I've only got four children. and only have a certain window of time with them. So a few months ago, I'm sitting in the house and... Um, 
It's been a busy season at church. I brought work home. It's never a good idea. I brought work home. Uh, and in my mind, I can justify, you know, I'm answering Jesus's emails. I'm a pastor. You know what I mean? Heaven is in contact with me. And this is so important that I do this stuff. You know, and falsely, sometimes you think that if I wasn't alive, the kingdom of God would grind a halt. And it's nonsense. And anyway, I'm sitting in the front room. And I'm doing these emails and I'm feeling the pressure of stuff that I need to do. And my daughter walks over to me. And my daughter is a, is a big Mary Poppins fan. Mary Poppins, yeah. One day she's just going to come down from the sky with an umbrella, everybody. And she loves that mo movie. And she loves the row of white houses in London where she lived. And this is or where, where Mary Poppins worked. And uh, she says to me, my daughter says to me, while I'm trying to do these emails for Jesus, she said to me, Dad, come on. Let's get online and look at some really expensive houses in Kensington, London. I'm like, what? I'm here to help Jesus. Heaven needs me. Thank God I had the wherewithal to close my laptop, jump over on the sofa with her with my iPad. And before we knew it, we were Googling and looking at a $45 million home in Kensington, London. And I'm looking at, yeah, your mom and I could have this bedroom. Swipe, yeah, this could be your bedroom. Yeah, the boys could be outside in a cold shed. Yeah, we could do all of that. Knowing the whole time that we'll never be able to afford that house. But knowing as well, more importantly, that I will never have that moment again. And parents, God wants you to have a relationship with him. Yes, God wants you to have a very solid God view of yourself. But everybody in this room, we got to believe in the things that God believes in. Even if we're single, we need to believe in marriage that it comes from God. And you know what? Again, if you're single, you got to believe in family because it's the very fabric of society. And in a world today that's throwing all of this stuff up in the world, you know what? It's not about preaching it's about modeling something to them. Not perfect families, but parents that have life and priorities. It's important. Thanks, Mom. Thanks for clapping. That's good. Here, and the last point. Isn't it great when a preacher says the last point? This is the last point. It's like hope comes into the room. It's like there is a God. Okay. Priority number five. My relationship with my world. And this is probably one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. And look at it here. It says, for God so loved the what? Everyone said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's what God believes in. And I, and I love this. God loves the world. Christians, this is important. Mr. and Mrs. Christian. God loves the world. I know it's jacked up, but God loves the world. And it's not our job to sit in our lazy boy with our remote control and be watching CNN or Fox News or whatever you watch. And Jesus doesn't watch either of them because he watches the BBC. That's what he does. <laughs> and it's not our job to sit in the lazy boy and shout at the television. Oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, it's so awful. It's so terrible. Oh, it's so ungodly. It's so whatever. They're lost, everybody. They're lost. They're doing things that lost people do. Lost people do lost stuff. They're completely lost. They don't know. And our job is not to shout at them because God didn't sit on a lazy boy in heaven and shout at the earth. Do you know what he did? God got aboard. He came to earth. He moved into the neighborhood. He lived with people, broken people. He cried with them. He reached out to them. He loved on them. He got skin quite literally in the game. That's the job of the church. Because there's a whole bunch of people that just feel so far from God. And God said, I want to bring you in. I used to feel far from America. It's a little boy. The first time I ever came to America was 40 years ago last month. First place I ever came to in America was Minnesota. <laughs> you got to start at the bottom and work your way. No, I'm only joking. If you're from Minnesota, we can pray for you at the end of the service. And that big ball in the sky is called the sun. And... But I remember being there. I actually had a great time. I remember how we got from the airport to the house that we were staying in. Do you know what? 
We were put in the back of a truck. Ah, no safety belts or anything like that. And we survived. Yeah, so good. But little did I know as a little boy that God would call me to this great nation to serve him. I, I, I didn't realize that. And it was five years ago that we clearly knew God had called us. And we started the whole process of applying for a visa. America was in a post 9-11 world and we needed to get a visa. And getting a visa to come to this country is a big deal. And it's like filling out or writing out the Bible by hand. There's so many forms to get done, everybody. But we got a visa and we came to America. And when we came to America, and then we were told the best thing you could do now is get a green card. Get yourself a green card. So then we applied for a green card. And it's like writing the Bible out by hand three times. It just takes so much work. But everybody, we got a green card. I'm legal. I'm not good. I'm legal. I can be here today. Today. That's good. And it is, there's a certain irony in it that, you know, America says to an Irishman, come over here and you Irishman will give you a green card. <laughs> we do green. We hand out green. Thank you. Anyway, so we got a green card and then someone said, do you know what? There's something else you should get. And I'm going like, oh, what else is in the party pile? What else should we go for? And they said, you should get a global entry card. A global, I'm going to get myself a global entry card then. So I went to San Francisco airport, had an interview with the officer. Woo, she was incredible. And I got myself a global entry card. And it was only this summer that I got to try it out for the first time. So I was flying back from Ireland, and I was on an Airbus A380, everybody, and we landed at San Francisco Airport. Now, you got to get this. An Airbus A380 is the largest air passenger carrying aircraft in the world. There's over 600 people on that plane. That is half the population of Ireland. Like, I mean, half of Ireland were on the flight. The Kellys, the Murphys, the Shaughnessys, I mean, they're all on the flight. And it seemed like, you know, five more of these had landed at the one time. And, and, and an international airport, you've got your customs and immigration. And as we walked towards it, I got to say, the line was chaos. It was like back to Canada, everybody. And there was three sections for the line. There was the... Um, section for the United States uh, citizens with their little blue passport. Uh, and there was the rest of the world in the middle. And then there was another section over to the right. And, and I looked at the United States one. I mean, it was, even though know, like you all live here, to get back into your own country, the line was crazy. And the rest of the world, I could not believe the size of the line. It was like the children of Israel in the wilderness. And Moses was at the front going, let my people go. It was just insane. <clears throat> but then I took out my global entry card. <laughs> and I became a higher life form. <laughs> and I just nodded to all the United States citizens. <laughs> How are you doing? And I turned my nose up at the rest of the world. <laughs> and I didn't walk over to a line because there was no line for the global entry card. No line for the global. There's not even an officer for because they trust us over there. And, um, <laughs> and I just walked over with my global entry card and swiped it in a machine. The doors opened and I walked through. And I looked back at everybody else and went, losers! No, I did not. Listen, and that's what Jesus did for you on the cross. You felt far away from God. You thought, I'm never going to get in. I know all my sins. I know all my past. I know all my junk. I don't know what to sign. I don't know what to fill in. I don't know who's going to be my reference. I don't know. I don't have the money. I can't make this happen. And Jesus said, I did it all for you when I died on the cross. Your debt is paid. All the forms are done. Here's a divine entry card. You're in. Forever, it's free. He loves this world and he loves you. And some of you might still be sitting there thinking, I'm far from God. Simple question. How do you know that? Does anyone have God's address? Like, where does God live? But you're so far from him. I'm here to tell you today. You're not far from God. Because you know where God lives? In a sandals campus right here. You are so close to God. I mean, like, you're, like, really, really close to God. You're just one prayer away. 
And I want to give you that opportunity to pray that prayer. You see, a whole bunch of people in this room, they're not perfect. They're just forgiven. A whole bunch of people in this room have prayed a prayer before that just leads us into that number one relationship, the relationship with God. And you might be here going, Andrew, Andrew, I, I don't know all the rules. You don't need to. Andrew, Andrew, I can't give that much. I can't give a kidney. Don't worry, that's next week. No, I just... No, but listen, that's not what about. It's a simple step of faith that just says, I want to start a relationship with God. I never had one before, but I want to start it today. And it involves one prayer. I'm going to pray it now. I'm going to invite you to pray it with me. You don't have to pray it out loud. You can just pray it into yourself. Are you ready to do this? If you're not yet a Christian, you want to become one today. So I want you to close your eyes. I want you to bow your head. And I want you to say these words with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that when you came to earth, you died for my sins. And I confess, I'm a sinner. Jesus, would you take my past and give me your future? Jesus, would you take my sins and give me your forgiveness? And Jesus, would you take all my dreadful decisions and become the God of all of my future decisions and be my Lord forever. Again, with your eyes closed, head bowed, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you prayed that prayer for the first time. But when you raise your hand here at Sandals, the lights don't flash, your picture doesn't go on the screen, and you don't have to do the river dance with me on stage, nothing like that. When you raise your hand, it's me and you. It's just a small sign of the big decision you've made. So are you ready? If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, right now, put your hand up in the air. Come on. Lots and lots of people putting their hand up. Come on. Bleachers as well. Let's be courageous. Put your hand up if you prayed that prayer and you became a Christian today. That is, that is awesome, incredible. You can put your hand down. Father, I want to thank you for every single person who's made that decision today to start a relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that this would be the first day of the rest of their eternal life. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Here at Sandals Church, we really do believe that this vision of being real can change the world. Because Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you. Because when you donate, your money goes to creating places for people to be real all over this world. So man, I would love for you to be a part of that and you can make a donation today by clicking the link on this video or going to donate.se. So join us and join what God is doing through this vision of being real and have a great day.